We're waiting to kick everybody out. Whew. Anybody else's allergies bothering them? Oh, gosh. Yeah. Can't even see hardly. Feeling Let's pray. Bad. I can tell. <laughs> Father, we come before you. We bless you for this opportunity to go through your word. We pray that your word would be hidden in our hearts, that we wouldn't sin against you. We would discover, Lord, your greatness. We would discover, Lord, our lack, and then ask for your supply. And may you just be glorified in everything we do. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen. <coughs> where are we at? Philippians 3 is where we're going. You hear me now? All's well? So, He's in uh, 3. 3, 3, 3. 3 for me. There you go. Got it. All right. Speaking of 3, we're in Philippians 3. And... Um, <clears throat> initially going into this, I was kind of like, boy, I'm having difficulty really extrapolating much out of here. But then, you know, the more you read it, you know, God starts revealing little things. So let's just dive right in, read the first couple verses. It starts out 3-1 saying, finally, my brothers rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again and to safeguard. And it's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. So who are those dogs and mutilators of the flesh? Um, I think it's thought that those were Judaizers, and the Judaizers were very staunch um, Jewish Christians that still believed in the law of Moses, right? And so they said, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised if you're a male, and a bunch of other things that were very legalistic. And uh, you know, it's thought about eleven about eleven years before this was uh, what happened in Acts 15, which is when they came together with the uh, they had a grand council. That's just going to keep rotating. They had a, a a big a grand council over this topic. And it was, you know, the council of elders had determined that no, circumcision isn't a must to be Christian because that would be works-based Christianity, which we can't obviously have. It has to be faith-based. So that's where he's referring to there. Um, but, you know, it kind of makes me wonder, who do, who do we have that's the Judaizers of modern day? You know, who's the works-based, you know, look what I did, the glitter bug type people that <laughs> are, you know, thinking that, they're more holier than thou because of their actions, you know. So we got to watch out for those people. You know, these things, even though there's written in approximately 60-something A.D., this still applies to us today. There's uh, two Christian, what we would call Christian cults, that operate from that principle. You need to do this in order to receive that. <clears throat> and uh, it's no different. You're, our works, our mutilation of the flesh, no matter what we do physically, doesn't gain us access. It's only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. Our, our works should be a byproduct of our faith. Amen. So continuing on, <clears throat> let's read four through six. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, flaw, uh, faultless. So we'll stop there. So why is he getting all braggy on us? <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason is, um, you know, you got to remember what's happening at this point in time. He's talking to the church in Philippi, right? And the church in Philippi would have predominantly been Gentiles. So, you know, explaining this to them is, you know, like, hey, look, if anybody's got room to, bra to brag, it's me. You know, I've got this background. And, um, you know, really, he's not bragging. He's just kind of saying, look, this is, this, is, uh, this is who I am, and I have all this on my side, and I, you know, but still I consider, you know, it goes on to consider it being nothing. Another interesting thing I came up with in the commentary is um, when the Israelites were in exile, uh, the, only two um, the only two tribes that were allowed back into Israel was the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. So um, that's kind of interesting, just kind of on a side there. 
So let's continue on with seven. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Let's see, where did I want to stop? We'll go to 11. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Okay. So at this point, he's basically saying that all of his credentials, his earthly credentials, all these things that you know make him so great, it's useless. It's it's it. It might be great here on earth. It might have value, um, currently. You know, currently. But once it goes to anything that's, you know, heavenly, anything that's eternal, it has zero value whatsoever. And instead, he wants to, you know, he's given all this up, right? And he's, he's changed the attack of his life to go towards being more like Christ and to meeting Christ. And, you know, the one thing that kind of stood out in this section to me, I kind of thought verse 11 was a little bit clunky. Hmm. And somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. So he wants to become like him in death and somehow attain resurrection in the death. So when I read some commentaries on that, um, it was more stating that when he says somehow attain, it's not that he's uncertain of his future. It's just he doesn't know how this is going to happen. He doesn't know how this is going to look. You know, what is it going to be like the minute I get stoned to death or crucified or boiled in oil? Or you know, he, he pretty much was sure he was going to not die of natural causes at this point. I'm sure. You know, guy spent more time in jail than anybody, right? <laughs> so he's figuring that you know he's going to die of unnatural causes. But what is that going to look like when he passes over and he passes on? <clears throat> So, now, pressing on towards the goal is this next section. We're going to go 12 to 14. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to have taken a hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All right, now we're getting into some interesting stuff. Um, so first off, he admits that he's not perfect. You know, he goes, you know, and, and when he says already been made perfect, um, you know, of course, I'm. this is NIV that I'm reading. Um, it's actually uh, more likely a better what would you call it, translation, uh, that he's saying more likely made whole, you know, like his Christianity is fully, fully developed, right? Um, but not only does he say he's not been made perfect, at this point, we get into Paul's past a little bit. So in 13, or at the tail half of uh, 13, forgetting what is behind, I strain towards what is ahead. You got to remember back in... Um, you know, quite a while earlier, when Paul was Saul, he held the coats of the guys that stoned uh, Stephen, who was the first martyr for Christ. And I think that was Acts 7, seven. 57 through 60, I believe. So, you know, we do see one thing. Our, our, our biblical heroes here have a reoccurring theme. They all have... Some they all have skeletons in their closets, you know. <laughs> I mean, David did, you know, and he was a man after God's own heart. You know, here we've got, you know, Paul who wrote so much of the New Testament and had such an amazing, you know, life and, and so much zeal for Christ, but yet, you know, he was, you know, implicit, well, implicated, he was part of the stoning of the first martyr, you know, and he went and he went after the church, you know, he persecuted the church. And, you know, to me, I think that one area, one area where Satan wins an awful lot with us is reminding us of our past. Ooh. And, you know, we, we get this feeling that I'm not good enough because of what I have done. And, man, that is just one lie that Satan works, and he works it with, he works it really well. You know, 
our past is our past. That's behind us. You know, we're new. We're new beings in Christ, right? So that means we can throw off that old stuff. We can throw off yesterday's mistakes, and we can move forward, doing the right thing. You know, each day is a new opportunity to do the right thing for Christ. And we need to not worry about yesterday. I mean, yeah, we need to make things right. If, if you know, if I if I ticked off Kevin, I need to you know say, hey man, I didn't mean to do that. I'm sorry. You know, I need to make things right. But we need to get that behind us, and we need to move forward. Amen. And he's not saying that we don't recognize certain things that God has done. We set those as, as a memorial. But what we don't do is we don't dwell on our past failures or our personal accomplishments without God. Because right. in doing so, we're going to continue to look, look back. And the definition of look backslidden is to look back. So if all you did was look back, then if you didn't run into anything, you'll eventually find yourself walking in a complete circle. And he's saying, this one thing I do, I, I haven't attained perfection. I haven't attained that, uh, that walk where I look exactly like Jesus. But I'm continuing to move forward in my life with God. I'm putting aside everything else that I've done wrong or done right without him so that I can achieve a, a better walk with God. And it's really hard to do because our mind wants to look backwards. The only thing, it's the only time we really have clarity, right? Hindsight's say hindsight 2020. Right. But God's telling us to stop looking back where we think we have clarity and move forward by faith. That's hard. But the payoff, like it was with Paul, like it was with Abraham and so many of the other right. uh, people in the, in the scriptures, is huge. And that's what God asks us, uh, us to do. And we can have them as our reference. Right. You know, it's a matter of stepping out in faith. And, you know, once again, God is very consistent in that. I mean, you look even with Abraham and Isaac and, you know, I mean, just time and time and time again. But it's when we get held up in our past that we start, you know, making it about us. Ooh. Our, well, and it's, yeah, we become selfish. We make it about us and we, we take it out of God's hands. So, all right, let's see. <clears throat> What else do we got here? All right, starting, so we went to the end of 14. Let's go to 15 here. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if you, oh, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Let's uh, look that verse over. <clears throat> so, once again, I, th I feel like, you know, here's something that could be a little bit on the cocky side. You know, any of you that are mature, you should do the same thing that I'm doing. But there's a lot of truth to it. And I like in here that he puts, um, if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. You know, at that point he's saying, you know, if you do have a discrepancy, at least the way I'm reading this, if you do have a discrepancy, pray on it and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. Amen. And, that, and that's basically... I take that principle and I apply it to other people's lives. I'm not going to change people instantly by just communicating a word. What happens is, is I change them over a period of time by exposing them to the truth. That's why sometimes correction happens over a period of time. If somebody's in imminent danger, sure, you're going to correct them. But if somebody's not in imminent danger, then you need to teach them. And over a period of time, God reveals this to them. So that's not us being judgmental which we're always accused of being, yeah. some, uh, right, rightly accused of being, right. it's us teaching and people discovering the reality of God in their life. Right, when you do something over, you know, keep in mind too, you know, we, we have such a mentality as a society, you know, McDonald's mentality, right? I want it now and I want it my way, and, you know, this is what I want. But when things take time, they tend to stick, you know, it, it's really, um, you know, it's, it's a biblical principle. Once again, you know, it's building a foundation. When you build that foundation, it's there to last, and it holds up. Amen. <clears throat> so, verse 16, only let us live up to what we have already attained. What does that mean? I thought that was kind of an interesting one. I feel that that's uh, stating, you know, don't push on too far. Don't get too big for your britches. Don't go too far. God will reveal to you what you can handle when you can handle it and you know sometimes and we've all kind of known that person that gets a little bit out there because they're pressing on towards something that god really hasn't given them or revealed to them yet and sometimes that isn't a great witness to others oh so it's a matter of staying within our lane and you know stay in your lane bro. stay in your lane stay in your lane <laughs> do do what you know you can do <sighs> all right 
let's see. Let me just look at my notes real quick here. Ah. Okay, Philippians 3.17. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of all those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as, en live as enemies of the cross of, cross of Christ. So another area where I felt like, geez, you know, Paul, you know, come on, be like me, follow my example. But then, you know, when you think about this thing, I mean, what's going on here at this time? Um, you know, he can't exactly say to the church of Philippi, well, just open up into, the, you know, the book of Matthew and read that, you know, the gospels haven't really gone out yet, right? Um, or it's likely that the gospels haven't gone out. Not in written form. Not in written form. So at this point, Paul, Timothy, the, the, these early Christians are the closest thing to Christ that the Church of Philippi has ever seen. They don't have the example of Christ, so someone needs to be an example at that point, right? Because they don't, you know, Christ has done his thing, and even Paul never got to really meet Christ, <clears throat> unless you count his little incident that turned his life around. Well, it, it said that he was schooled in the Arabian Dares, so many believe, but he didn't have a physical contact when Jesus was living before the resurrection. Right, but he did He did go and meet um, several of the Christians that were the original apostles, right? And, and after that time. Right, and he, it's my understanding that it almost sounded like he really grilled them. Like, okay, exactly <laughs> what, now tell me again, how did that work, it. you know, when he's taking notes That would be Paul. That would be Paul. So, you know, at this point, once again, you know, like I said, it sounds a little bit like be like me, but the reason for that is because they don't have any other example. And, you know, how can we apply that to our lives? I mean, how many people do you think that we run into where we end up having to be, you know, we're the example? And, and in this, he's saying, note those who are doing the walk. But this is really important. Todd said that we got, you know, we don't want to put people in this cookie-cutter Christian mold. But at the same point, we need to follow the same pattern. And it's not, if you follow a copy of a copy of a copy, it doesn't take too long before what you're following is... Um, is blurred or completely changed. And that's not mm -hmm. what Paul's asking us to do here. He's asking us to go back and copy the original, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when we do that, we have a pattern for those who have copied Christ and those even in the Old Testament who was following the righteous path so that we can follow that one true example rather than a bunch of copies of a bunch of copies of a bunch of copies. That way we don't get obscured. Right. Yep. So I'm going to go back to 18 here again. <clears throat> For as I, I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as, live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Mm. Their mind is on earthly things. Wow. <laughs> that applies to so many of us, <laughs> me included at times, you know, I mean... Yeah, life sure would be better if I had that big diesel truck, and boy, I really do deserve to own a M1A1, and you know all these things that are earthly. That you know, what's the value in it? Oh, but then when we go and we put our focus on things that are heavenly, you know, kind of as Paul said earlier in this verse, you know, at that point you're starting to really invest in your future. You know, I mean, we've got such a small amount of time here on this earth versus what eternity looks like. I mean, you think. 25 million years is nothing in relation to eternity. Amen. And 25 million years sure sounds like a long time to me, you know? And to take and put our effort into that future, I mean, really, it is the greatest investment any of us can make. And, you know, that doesn't mean, at the same time, I think it's nice to have nice things, right? I mean, it's good to, ha it's, it's good to have desires, but it's where is your focal point on that? Amen. If that's your number one priority, you know, you might want to have another look at things. I need, I need to read my translation for Steve Garner. It says, whose end is destruction? Who, whose God is their belly? And whose glory is in their shame? So, Steve, watch your diet. <laughs> you ever feel like you're being singled out, Steve? <laughs> Love you, man. <laughs> but, yeah, and that's, you know, you think about it, really, it's easy. I mean, that's part of our human nature is to want to be that way and worry about that. But, you know, I think as we... As we make it more of a focus to focus on eternal things, to focus on, you know, being a representative for Christ, um, it becomes easier and easier mm. to, you know, it becomes more routine. It, it becomes more second nature to be that way. 
And quite honestly, it's a great way to live. Amen. Especially being that we have, uh, we know that their destiny is in destruction. <laughs> Ooh. So verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick that apart. Citizenship. What does it mean to have citizenship? It means that you have rights. Now, you know, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, all right, so we're not really, if our citizenship is in heaven, we're not in our home base right now. But we have certain rights and privileges in heaven. They might not be very applicable to where we're at, but when we get to where we're going, you know, we're covered there. Amen. So take that word citizenship. In Paul's day, the ultimate of the whole basically the whole known world right there is to be a Roman citizen. And the reason why is because once you're a Roman citizen, you had all sorts of rights that you did not have if you weren't a Roman citizen. Paul was born a Roman citizen. So once they found out that he was a Roman citizen, they couldn't just beat him without trial. And so um, it was a high prize, so to speak, to be a Roman citizen. And now Paul says that, no, 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 no. The highest prize is to recognize that you're a citizen of heaven your home base is not here your access point is heavenly not earthly and not only are you going to you're going to not be condemned you're going to be rewarded whoa and then he goes on to say the bible goes on to say we are ambassadors for christ so while this isn't our home we're just simply to reflect our home territory who he is and so in paul's day that carried a lot of weight of being a citizen it's like um it used to carry more weight here. You'd be a citizen, mm -hmm. and we had all sorts of rights that no one else did. We had more rights than anybody else in the world. Yep. And everybody wants to be a citizen of the United States because of those rights. Well, Paul takes that same understanding, which meant more in his day, and to institute, like, our citizenship, our rights come from the very creator himself. Right. And, you know, touchy subject, but when it comes down to that, we continue to dilute um, the value of our citizenship. We give the rights to people that are not citizens. We're diluting the value of citizenship. I mean, that's not a good thing. Well, and, and in that way, let's go uh, in, a, in a scriptural picture. Mm -hmm. In that way, God can't let everybody in. Right. Because if he let everybody in, then it would not be heaven, and he would condone sin for all eternity, and that goes against God's nature. Right. Ooh, that's a good word. I have to remember that one. <laughs> go against God's nature. Amen. He's all inclusive, but there's, there's rules to be followed. Amen. So our last verse, 21. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. What a statement. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. You know, there we go just once again, finalizing or, or reinforcing the, uh, the God's great power. I mean, he can bring everything under his control. And he's the king of our citizenship, right? He is the king. He is the king. Um, the final statement I just want to share. Um, in verses 4 through... Basically 4 through 11... But uh, the first part, Paul is describing, and th this is a point, he's describing his credentials. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that helps in a discussion we've been having online and other places. Paul's describing his credentials, and he says, at the end of it, really, they don't matter. What matters is, is that I know him. That I know him. And by knowing him, I'm willing to suffer with him that I might attain the resurrection because it's something to be prized. He was able to forget those things. Why? Because they didn't matter in comparison. And when it, when it comes to understanding godly principles, it's a worldly thing to have credentials, not a heavenly thing. And in a heavenly perspective, what makes us credentialed is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Not what other people say, not about our schooling. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's the power. Because once we have a relationship with God, once we have a relationship with Jesus, now we are citizens of heaven. Now we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now we have a different life and a different call. That's why God is able to take those from the gutter and, and make them somebody. Because it's dependent upon Him. 
and we recognize what God's doing. I think that's so powerful. When you recognize what God's doing, then you lay hands on that. If we try to put ourselves in that place, we can put ourselves through education and never have any power, never have any authority, because it wasn't our call. And so, as it says in verse 16, only, come on. only let us live up to what we've already attained. Which is, right. That's awesome. Right on. And so yeah. then we have this life. Go well, ahead, and the, with the credential, off. regarding the credential thing, I mean, you know, that the only reason his credentials meant anything is because it was what other humans said that they had value. You know, it had no heavenly value. It just had value because people said, you know. <coughs> and, and that, and that, and that's, that's true. But I, I want to go back to what he said here. Who will transform our low, lowly bodies hmm. so that we will have a glorious body? You know what the hope is? The hope isn't, the hope isn't just to uh, live a thousand years on the earth. You could probably just take that and put it outside. I think it's Debbie's. Thank you. Or I will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the key point in that uh, is this. He's transforming us so that we will be like him. And that's our hope. It's not just a thousand year reign. It's not just end up you know, doing good works here and just hope that we might inherit a planet. There's a reason why I'm speaking these things. Hope we might inherit a planet. No, the hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And John says, when we see him, we shall be like him. That's hope, you know, and, he, and he's not just saying, hey, I'm just going to I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of time to bless you in the future. No, he's saying, I'm going to give you all eternity. If God didn't give it eternity, that means Jesus is a liar. Mm. Mm. So when those other cults, so to speak, come and I'm trying to be kind, but also firm when they come and they speak to you of other things besides the truth and reality what Jesus spoke you can you can just flush it down the toilet because it would cause Jesus to be a liar and he can't be right so that if Jesus is a liar it means that what they're present is he's not a liar then it mean, means that what they're presenting to me is a lie that's it anything else no. all right questions Sue Okay, so I, I, as I was reading different commentary, one of the things I stumbled across was that when the um, Israelites were in exile out of out of Israel, uh, when they when they did their thing, when they came back in, it was only the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah that were allowed back into Israel. You know, the other the other what was it, twelve tribes, right? Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll clarify it. When when Solomon died, remember there was a split in the kingdom. And the split in the kingdom went Judah and Benjamin and all the other tribes. And Judah and Benjamin are centered around what we call Jerusalem. And so that, that's the kingdom of Judah. And so all the other tribes are outside that. And what Todd's saying is, and then the Assyrians came in and mixed, and then Judah was actually led into captivity. So that's the difference between the two kingdoms. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Bill. Two things. Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Levi is well, you didn't right. think about that. That's a good point. And then uh, the reason there are ten tribes in the northern kingdom and three in the southern kingdom, but you only have twelve. Because they don't count. Because Levi. The tribe of Joseph is something called Ephraim and Manasseh. Right. So what caught my attention is you said the Gospels weren't written by the time this letter was written, and I just I want to offer you another offer, another possibility. Mm -hmm. That idea came out of German liberalism in the okay. last century. Uh, the book of Acts is written by Luke to the same person that he wrote the Gospel of Luke, so you can call it Second Luke. Okay. It was written while Paul was alive, so that means Luke one, the first Luke was written before Acts. Sure. And he says he referred to what the other eyewitnesses said, okay, or wrote. Mm -hmm. And that indicates that they, their gospels were in existence. And prior to German liberalism, 
they believe that Matthew was first. Right now, the uh, popular theory Mark, Mark, Mark was first. Yeah. Uh, and they dated Matthew's gospel as early as 41 AD. Okay. okay. So it is very possible that all four gospels were written by the time all of this. Right, but I, I guess. And you're absolutely correct. I guess what I was driving at was more um, the the likelihood of them being highly circulated was more. that that's true, right? You know, so there is a good possibility that they weren't really readily available to everybody. Because I mean, this correct me if I'm wrong, but this is taking place what we were just reading in Philippi, right? Right around the '60s, '80, right? Mm -hmm. So it would have been about 20 years later. Yeah. Okay. Amen. And then and then go along with that is the fact that even though those are written like um, Todd said, they weren't widely circulated. But here's the thing. Old, you know, it, it wasn't too long before early church fathers were quoting Scripture. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of an amazing thing. You think about it. Because it was so valued, even then, that it was quoted from, it, it was given the authority or authorized for us. Chuck. Verse 16. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. What we have attained is salvation, and that's you will live up to that gift. That's my reading. Of that. So, you're right because it ties into a mm -hmm. previous verse in chapter two, which says, "Work out your salvation with fear and trembling." So there should be something in us that should work out in us to basically. To be obedient to God. We should have this desire that's in us to obey God. And once we have that desire, it's following that desire. That's working it out. If you don't have that desire, then the question is, are you his? And I don't believe you would be. Because it says that his spirit communicates with our spirit that with children. Mike. I see some other things in this, uh, especially 16. And that is that even with the best of intentions, sometimes we get ahead of God. Mm -hmm. Or we try to do it for him, or we even get in way. What do you think about that? I couldn't agree more. No, I absolutely agree with that. You know, and that's why, you know, stay in your lane. Don't get beyond what you're capable of. <laughs> I love that. I, I like it too. But yeah, don't get beyond what you're capable of because you'll end up trying to do it on your own, and you're going to fail miserably, and, you know, you're going to do more harm than good. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, personally, I think. Um, I know a lot of people focus on chapter 4, but chapter 3 is pretty profound to me. And here's why. Paul's saying, hey, my life, if you summed it up, it was nothing before. The word rubbish is really dung. It was manure. He's saying everything that I thought I accomplished in my life without Christ is actually manure. And the resurrection, this is why the resurrection is the hinge point. The resurrection was so glorious that it's worth me suffering the rest of my life to attain to that. Think about this. How would you like, it, it must have been so radical for Paul, who's, who's the guy. Literally, I, I would imagine that if Paul stuck in the confines of Judaism, he might have been similar to the high priest. He was the guy. Mm -hmm. okay? And he was willing to leave all that in an instant once he was exposed to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And not only was he ready to leave it, he was ready to suffer and do whatever it took. Can you imagine the humility Paul must have experienced going back to the people that he persecuted? <laughs> Can you imagine that? The humility. And it's something that stuck with him because he kept bringing it up from time to time. Look, I, I'm one born out of due season. Oh, I shouldn't be here. I'm the least because look who I was before. This resurrection must be so powerful. And though we didn't see Jesus face to face like Paul did in his resurrected form, we have the Holy Spirit revealing these things to us. And if somebody who was so clear of thought like the Apostle Paul was willing to jump ship right into Jesus, boy, that gives me confidence in my walk. Well, and just what he turned down on an earthly, um, on an earthly level, you know, he could have been in a lot of, uh, had a lot of control, a lot of power, and a lot of money. Um, with his pedigree that he had. Amen. But he threw all that away and, and instead ended up, you know, spending most of his life in prison and, you know, got beat up on pretty good quite a bit. So he chose the harder path and it was for, uh, for good reason, you know, and so do we take a harder path? Um, um, oh, Sarah. <laughs> Right? He mm -hmm. says, you know, leave your family, don't even bury your father, don't say goodbye, right. pick up your cross. Um, 
I mean, Paul did what was asked of the disciples wholeheartedly. And it was even, and you know, like you said, he never really got to meet Christ face to face, right? He, he saw him in Damascus uh, with his vision and whatnot, but he did exactly what he was supposed to do. And I think, you know, going back to what you had said earlier about like how we surround our stuff with our stuff, mm -hmm. surround ourselves with our stuff, like we're getting really off track these days. We're very off track. And does it show in our modern culture that we're off track? Ooh, oh, I mean, it, it's it, and you know we we worship things. We put idols before, you know, before God all the time, and you know it's just a matter of you know having the proper mindset. You know, where's your, where's your eternal mindset? And and that that's really key. Because Paul says, going back to chapter one, this is why having different views of. And going through it like we have been is so powerful because now as you go with this understanding you go back to chapter 1 verse 21 for me to live is Christ and to die is gain yeah. so just as we discovered now these verses carry more weight when you see the description of who Paul was and the time period and everything else and now when we examine our lives how much more do we need to make sure that we're living for Christ instead of living for ourselves because I like that verse in the opposite for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Well, here's the scary part. Let's look at that in the opposite. For me to live for myself and die would be loss. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Yeah. I mean, that's incredibly scary. So we need that constant evaluation. Uh, I want to plug something in here. We've been watching t videos on Tuesday night of some profound things. We're going to watch one on the, on the Revelation Four Views. But in that, we watched uh, Francis Chan and, and uh, Ravi Zacharias. And they just, that one of the questions asked is, why aren't we seeing people describe Jesus as God? And a lot of times in our culture, people say Jesus is a good teacher, but why aren't they ascribing him to be God? And, and uh, one of the key aspects is, is that we're not teaching that. And Francis Chan went on to say that we don't teach the fear of the Lord. We teach, oh, Jesus is, Jesus is my buddy and he's okay. Right. Well, Jesus is also judge, man. And yeah. Francis Chan says, when you see that he's all, he, he's got the keys, he's the judge, and, and it's fearful, then you can also see that he's also all merciful, and I can embrace that, and it carries more weight. So we really do need to get back to teaching the full picture of, of God and who he is. We try to compartmentalize him to lessen yeah. his effect. Fit and him into our box. Fit him into our box. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, I really, just to touch on that, I really like that view. You know, I, I, we don't really think that way about Christ being, you know, I, I like <laughs> I like the Jesus that flips over the money changers' tables, right? Like, I, I, want, I want a Jesus who's strong, you know. I want who has, my God's got to have authority, right? Amen. And, and how that works is you got, you know, in Isaiah 53, they used to think that there was um, two different messiahs, but there's one messiah, two different time periods. The first appearing to Jesus, he comes as a lamb of God. Well, a lamb's not very fearful, is it? Mm -hmm. He came as the sacrificial one. But when he returns, he's a lion from the tribe of Judah. And watch mm -hmm. out, because his, his eyes are like fire. And out of his mouth, he speaks, and it's a sword, and it kills, and it cuts, and destroys. Well, we need that full picture of God. You know why? Because when we know that he's standing on our side, and we face the enemy horde against us, Guess what? He's able to destroy them just by a spoken word. That's comforting to know that I can, my dad and my father and, and my God and my Savior, he's all powerful. Mm -hmm. You got time maybe for one more? No? None. All, all right. right, let's pray out. Father, we thank you for your word that it carries weight and substance, it carries glory. I pray, God, that you would just continue to stir it up in us, that we would change, that we would come and, and, and know you even more. Lord, um, I thank you that we're trying to get things right. And even when we might mess up, Lord, there's so much love and correction and opportunity. And I just thank you, Lord, that we see it. And we don't want to ever come um, from a place of arrogance even Paul when he comes from a place of arrogance it seems like he goes right back into it and he goes it's not me I just I count it all loss and so Lord may we have that humility may we see who you are and respond accordingly we love you and we honor you in Jesus name
Amen. Amen.